from the late teens by Theo Van Duesburg. This painting is entitled The Cow. And when asked about that, Van Duesburg said that in the lower right-hand corner, that red and black configuration is a head, then there's the neck, here's the body of the cow, the four legs, the udder, and the tail. Cow or no cow, it's a brilliant balancing of darker planes around this warm yellow central plane. It's a very dynamic and vital composition. The initial group were joined by others. Garrett Rittveld was a furniture maker and designer and architect. This is his calling card which he designed for himself and looking at the simplicity of these letters and the nature of this configuration of someone working in a wood shop, it's very easy to see why Garrett Rittveld felt a real communal relationship to the De Stael painters and became a member of their group. Rittveld applied the principles of De Stael to this chair Do you think this chair would be comfortable? No. I had the privilege of sitting in one of these chairs and it's very comfortable. Let's take a view so you can see how the seat and the back are two planes. Now how does this chair become comfortable? Oh. Here's what he did. This plane of wood was attached here with a a hinge, kind of like a piano hinge. This one, which loops back here, was attached here with a piano hinge. So the weight of the plane and its movement against the li linear strokes is what held these in position except this one attachment point. So when you sit in this chair, this plane and this plane both give slightly Organically, and wood is a natural material, these boards are thin enough that they will bend a little bit to fit the contour of your back. Also, Rittveld said that his intent was to design a chair for alert, contemplative activity. This is a chair that you sit in when you're studying for an exam. It's not a soft, easy chair, a lazy boy that you sit in when you want to relax. An interesting story about the prototypes for this chair that I will tell you about real quickly because it gives you a sense of the economy that the Dutch have. And the chair I sat in was in a, a conference room at a school that had set up their conference room as a little museum of 20th century chairs. They wanted a prototype of this chair so they wrote the museum in Holland and said, we're interested in building a prototype of Rittveld's chair. Could we get some, somehow get some plans or permission to do this? They wrote back and said a very elderly cabinet maker working in Holland who had worked with Rittveld and had actually constructed some of his prototypes would still make a, a version of the chair as a custom one-of-a-kind chair gave him the information to write him and how much it would be and so forth. So they engaged this cabinet maker to make them a duplicate or a replication of this chair for their conference room. The faculty member at this school who had worked on this liked the chair so much that he decided he would like to make one for himself. So he measured all the parts and he went around, he found the wood, they worked on it and he retained a carpenter to help him construct it. And then they discovered that they could not find a paint to match that luminous red translucent enamel that was painted on the back plane. They were able to find the yellow, the black, and the blue or something close enough. So they wrote the cabinet maker and explained the problem and asked if they could purchase some of the red paint. Very quickly, surprisingly soon, 
a package arrived from Holland that had a, was a little box, a little cardboard box. Inside, it had a little tin can of paint and an invoice for a modest amount of money for the paint. And the little can was only three-fourths full. They said, we can't possibly paint that red plain with this paint. We'll try anyway. So they got a brush and very carefully started painting. It looked like it wasn't going to make it. Then they had an area left. And there was a little paint in the bottle. They turned the can on the side and took the brush, you know, hey, you'll go and sort of scoop up the last little bit, and then painted it, and it came out absolutely perfectly. The cabinet maker had shipped them the exact amount of paint, no wastage, no shortage. That is the Dutch sensibility of economy, purity, and order. And it was this sensibility, this national sensibility, that gave rise to the De Stijl movement. It's a painting by Mondrian. Here he's operating on a premise. What if we make all of these grid divisions, horizontals and verticals, even, and then modulate the color asymmetrically on this grid? We find this very beautiful and dynamic painting as a result. There are several paths that lead from the De Stijl movement. One is the impact on graphic design and typography. One is the impact upon architecture. One is the impact upon furniture design. One is the continuing evolution of Mondrian's paintings. Mondrian, like Malievich, did not involve himself in functional design for the most part. Rather, he continued to work with painting. So from 1917 until his death, in the early 1940s, as an expatriate, an immigrant who had come to New York City as a result of the Nazi Holocaust and the fact that Holland was no longer safe for an artist of his advanced and experimental approach, for that long period of time, Mondrian worked with this vocabulary of de Stijl, struggling over his paintings, struggling for this absolute order and balance and harmony, for this spiritual integrity. Cubism had unleashed a situation where art now had the condition of music, the potential for invention, for variation, for experimentation, for creation was unlimited. Here, Three black bars, a yellow plane, a blue plane. That yellow and blue are in absolute balance. Four yellow bars on a diamond-shaped canvas. The thickness varies in each bar slightly to create a dy dynamic, asymmetrical balance. Mondrian did not use a ruler in his work or mathematical measure. He would establish his lines by using tabs of paper with marks. This is completely an intuitive balancing of form evaluated by the rational intellect and then reworked. It's an amazing composition with these three horizontals and two verticals in this configuration and the red at the bottom. This painting from the 30s, we see the introduction of little bars of color as a variation. For the simplicity of Mondrian's work, he turned out hundreds of paintings that were all very different, exploring different ideas about space and color. This painting that was left in his studio after his death shows us his working method. We can see that these things aren't predetermined and rendered, but they're like a drawing that develops through trial and error and addition and subtraction. Here we see that he was going to, he felt like there was a need for some further activity on the left-hand side, and he had struck these two charcoal lines, erased them and moved them, 
and he was contemplating adding a set of lines there, which then means that something would have probably had to change on the right, because the right becomes almost too much of a checkerboard right now, the way the horizontal and vertical divisions are so regular. After he came to New York in the early 40s, he discovered this 3M colored plastic tape in colors, and he began to paint with lines because he could use that tape to move it around to make his composition, and then remove the tape and paint in the lines after he had determined how he wanted the composition to occur. One of his last great masterpieces is called Broadway Boogie Woogie. And if you know Boogie Woogie music, which was the hot thing at the time, it was like Madonna today, you know, bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba. There's a real lively staccato rhythm operative. He loved New York City. He wanted this painting to be a spiritual allegory for the city, the rhythm of the city, music, the energy and rhythm of the music. It's truly a masterpiece. Another painting that's incomplete that he was working on when he died is called Victory Boogie Woogie. Because in 1944, it was apparent that the Allied forces were probably going to win World War II. Mondrian was very committed to his art. He worked very diligently in his studio. Let's jump back now to 1917 and look at some of the other things that were spawned by this group of people forming this new vocabulary. Here's the first issue of De Style magazine that Theo Van Duesberg edited and published from his own limited resources. Ads inside. The top ad would be typical of late Art Nouveau decorativeness, even though it's not classical Art Nouveau, or late Victorian decorativeness. The lower ads, with their geometric division of space and their sans-serif type, would symbolize or represent the impact of the style upon typography, with this simplification and reduction to an absolute ordering. These two plates are instructive. They were reproduced in the style in 1919. A on the left shows the principles of asymmetrical balance at work with the kind of dynamic equilibrium. B shows a false composition. It's essentially a very regular checkerboard that does not have the dynamic asymmetrical properties that we find on the painting on the left. These were done by Hussar, one of the participants in the De Style movement, to show this very point that I just discussed. Here's the cover of the revised format in 1922. Theo Van Duesberg struck an imaginary rectangle on the rectangle. He moved these pieces of information to the corners asymmetrically balanced them, and then placed that one there. Two things were operative with the use of red and black, and this relates to Russian constructivism. One thing was the property of red relative to black and the way red works against black. The other thing was the fact that these artists were seeking a new order. They were revolutionaries. In Europe at the time, red was a symbolic color for revolution. Van Duesberg speculated in the early 20s about the application of the style principles to architecture. And we find this isometric schematic that was reproduced showing an architecture made up of planes. So we have to credit Van Duesberg with the concept of how is the style going to impact architecture. Van Duesberg was very much interested in the Dada movement. This seems like a contradiction. Dada wanted to destroy, the De style wanted to construct. But that was the very point. Van Duesberg was interested in Dada as something that could destroy the old order, thereby making available the possibility of creating a new order out of the ashes. 
This issue of De Stael says anthology Bonset. Bonset was a pseudonym that Theo Van Duesberg went by when he became a Dada poet and artist. Here's one of his poems, Rensel, 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 Blickentromo, 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 Rensel, Blickentromo, 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 Rensel. He never let Mondrian know that he was I.K. Bonset. He was afraid Mondrian would just stop speaking to him. And in fact, Mondrian wrote Theo Van Duesberg a letter warning him against Bonset, said, stop collaborating with that guy and hanging around with that guy. He's stealing some of our ideas. I don't trust him. In 1922, Van Duesburg organized an international conference of Dadaist and constructivist. Here's Van Duesburg in the middle, wearing an issue of De Stael on his head. El Lizitsky and Kurt Schwitters are here, along with Tristan Zara and a number of the other people we have talked about. We think of these avant-garde movements as isolated entities, but in fact, there was a flow of information and collaboration between them. Here's a Dada poster by Theo Van Duesburg, probably helped out by Kurt Schwitters. Van Duesburg arranged for Kurt Schwitters to come to Holland. Van Duesburg gave a series of lectures through Holland, charged admission, about Dada. What is Dada? What is this movement? And at some point in the lecture, he'd say, we have one of the leading German Dadaists here, Mr. Kurt Schwitters from Hanover, Germany. Would you stand up and say a few words? Kurt Schwitters would get up and say, woof, woof, woo, woof, 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 bark like a dog, walk out. <laughs> the Dutch, being the orderly people that they are, thought this was a real gas. Look at that crazy German. So the other lectures as they went through the cities were packed with people who came to see the German Dadaist bark. Sometimes Schwitters would bark, sometimes he wouldn't. They collaborated on the book, The Scarecrow Marches. We talked about the Scarecrow Marches when we talked about the Dada movement. Here's the cover with that X figure that we looked at earlier. Also, Theo Van Duesburg collaborated with El Lizitsky. Both of them were spending time in Germany. This is a cover to issue 10 and 11, a joint issue. This is a double page spread by El Lizitsky with this typographic configuration on this side. On the other side, it's a black page with a line, and along the line, it says Mondrian. This slide is upside down. It's a back cover for De Stael magazine, a set of ads. It becomes very close to the De Stael paintings, the spatial intervals, the s openness of the space and the balance and the simplicity and economy all relate to the De Stael painting movement. Lettering by Theo Van Duesburg, in which he was attempting to move letter forms toward the harmony of De Stael. All diagonals and curved strokes are purged. You gain a wonderful sense of order and consistency you lose a measure of legibility and readability because the contrast between those diagonal and curved and horizontal and vertical strokes is what gives character definition to the characters and word pattern to words. But when it becomes harmonized to this degree, it becomes harder to read. Here's a poster for an exhibition. This was hand-lettered in pen and ink and drafting instruments by Theo Van Duesburg. It's for an international exhibition of La Section d'Or of Cubism and Neo-Cubism. You don't hear much about Neo-Cubism anymore. That was sort of a temporary term to use for the things that followed Cubism. A poster by Van Duesburg, The Wonderful Simplicity and Openness, 
we're looking at it on an angle. A lot of these slides I made in various museums and exhibitions. Some of them will be a little off. A cover by Van Duesburg for his essay, Classical and Modern Art. Note how the letter forms move across the rectangles. Particularly interesting is that word in the middle and what happens to it as a configuration as it crosses two squares. A magnificent ad by one of the De Stael artists, totally functional, beautifully balanced. Note how the arrows are used to call your attention to important information. There's an interesting visual hierarchy of elements occurring here. A cover for Windingen Magazine, special issue on Diego Rivera. This was designed by Vilmos Hussar later. This was 1929. So you have a wonderful vitality to the ordering and structuring of this information. Later, we will talk about the Bauhaus School in Germany. These are two books published by the Bauhaus. One is Pete Mondrian on the New York Art in front, which is Bauhaus Book 5. The one in the rear is Theo van Duesburg. As scuffed up as these are from being read and handled over a period of time, they're beautiful examples of the harmony and order of de style applied to the problem of graphic design. The pure color, the simple elementary typefaces, the horizontal and vertical structuring, and the balancing of elements to achieve a harmony. It's very important that this 5 is big down here in opposition to this G, for example. Late work by Bart, Bart Vanderlick. We see that the illustrations become a kind of geometric stencil treatment. We also find that the typeface he designed is an open stencil quality typeface that has the properties of de style. Note the use of little squares of color to indicate the start of a paragraph, the bars of color to indicate a new section, and then the bars of color to indicate the end of certain important sections in the book. It's probably the ultimate de style book in terms of applying these principles of harmony and structure and primary color to the problem of book design. It's a poster by Hussar. This was 1929. The diagonal becomes interesting. It's a break. Mondrian and Theo van Duesburg parted company when Theo van Duesburg suddenly decided he was going to develop the theory of elementalism and that the diagonal was more dynamic than horizontals and verticals. Mondrian was beside himself, and their collaboration ended around the mid-20s when Van Duesburg made this theoretical break without talking to Mondrian about it or consulting him. Just, I have an idea, and I wrote, he wrote an article about this theory of elementalism, published it into style, and Mondrian was upset. Hussar here was exploring the dynamic of the diagonal. Application to architecture. All over the world, there are floors of linoleum and vinyl that trace their, her their heritage to this floor. This design in the late teens for a floor by Theo van Duesburg. This was a tile floor. It's made up of a dynamic geometric configuration of white, yellow, and black. This is his working plan. Here we're looking down the stairwell at the floor on the first floor. Note the treatment of black around the floor and around the doors. And note the way the stairwell has a geometric step quality. This building is probably the first one to begin to apply some of the ideas of the style around 1918, 1919 to the problem of architecture. But the first true de style building 
is the Schroeder House, built in Holland in 1924, designed by Garrett Rittveld. Here's the model. We can see that it's made up of planes in space, very dynamic, open composition. Here's the house. Looking at the street that it was on with the house next to it, it's little wonder that the Schroeder children suffered taunts at school, that rocks were thrown at the house by neighbors who were offended that this wild modern avant-garde building went up at the end of the block. It's a detail of the second floor balcony show, showing a plane that's just literally floating a suspended in space there on the balcony. This photograph was made right after the house was built. Wonderful property of light and air. Here's the dining room, and note how this window opens up and just opens up the whole corner of the house. This house is now a museum. The lady who commissioned this, Ms. Schroeder, was certainly a very courageous and perceptive woman. Inside the dining room, Note the industrial radiators. Note the openness of the structure, the linear quality of the structure, and the way the corner is open, and that window that's open wrapped around the corner, and then the support beam is moved off the corner a little bit. This would give this dynamic asymmetrical property. Note the use of yellow on the woodwork and just above the radiator. The floor plan was very open. These petitions would move in space so you could close off an area for privacy or open up the space and let it flow. This photograph was made right after the house was built, and we can see that all the furniture is built according to the style principles. See Café de Uni, which is by J.J.P. Ald one of the initial members of the movement. This shows the color treatment, the integration of letter forms and information with architecture and structure. Here's a black and white photograph made at the time. I'm told that this cafe, this important building in architecture was destroyed during World War II. Note how the signage functions. The low sign on the right functioned for pedestrians close by. The high sign functioned for people across the street in the high-rise buildings a ways away, way down the street. And then this vertical sign worked for people in cars or on foot coming down the street and be two or three blocks away. Very careful and rational and logical in planning this signage. And that's an important aspect of all the style design was this rational, logical qualities. This is a theoretical design as opposed to an actual room. But Mondrian and some of the others collaborated on working out this room that becomes sort of a, a theoretical, a prototype de style room. Rittveld was very active in furniture design. Here's a beautiful hutch or cabinet to go in a dining room. Note how the furniture is made of these horizontal and vertical members that overlap, and then how the drawers are so open they aren't com confined like drawers in most things, but they're very open and you can just reach in here and pull it out. The doors are planes that float in front of the structure, which open up. A lighting fixture by Rittveld, beautiful. These three independent lights hang by glass tubes that have wires inside, and they're placed in this dynamic three-way relationship. As you move around this lighting fixture, it changes and looks different from all different angles. Rittveld was very conscious of the notion that furniture and architecture has this three-dimensional compositional property that all sculpture has and that it has to work 
and its visual design properties, no matter what angle you look at it. And as I was looking at the 10 or so slides that I made of this, trying to pick which one was best to bring to class today, they were all equally good, even though some were from a distance, some were close up and from different angles. It seemed to work as you move around it as a composition that's been very carefully considered. Ritveld's wheelbarrow. It makes me happy every time I see this wheelbarrow. Those beautiful, bright colors. And that happiness that I feel when I see this wheelbarrow is an important spiritual aspect of what this style was about. Now, the joyous simplicity and purity was important to them. Now, I love this table. It's a circular plane for a base, two vertical planes and a horizontal plane plus a linear strip for support for that top. Isn't that beautiful? It's wonderful. It's a table. It would be a little table to hold a lamp and go by your chair. It's actually a rather, it looks bigger in the slide than it actually is. There are a number of commissions which were quite successful. This is a commission that Van Duesberg led a collaborative group. This was actually built. It's now destroyed. There's a combination restaurant dance hall theater in France. The booze went here. This is a model, a reconstruction. The booze went here. You could dance in the middle. You see the movie screen at the end of the wall. And these environmental planes of color turned this into this wonderful overall environment. Signage for that cafe, which you maybe have difficulty seeing, but here Theo Van Duesberg has worked out colors and numerical symbols to work out signage. We see words such as cabaret and bathrooms, billiards, an identification system to harmonize with the architectural and interior design treatment. This is one of Theo Van Duesberg's paintings. It was done after he developed this theory of elementalism, which ended his relationship to Mondrian. It's a beautiful and dynamic painting in which the horizontals and verticals of the style are just rotated within the frame to compose with diagonal movements instead of horizontal and vertical movements. Probably one of the most exciting red squares in the history of art. This is the cover for the final issue of De Style magazine. Van Duesberg died early. He was, I believe, in his early 50s when he died in 1931. His wife and some of the other members of the group put together the final issue, which dealt with his life and his work. It reproduced his experimental architecture, his paintings, his typography. It reprinted some of his essays and articles on the theory of art, the theory of design. As a movement, the style collapsed with the death of Theo Van Duesberg. When I said he was the founder and guiding spirit, I could have said that for all practical purposes, he was the style. He was the energy that held the movement together, that promoted the movement. He never had very much money. These avant-garde artists were not rich and successful in terms of the material world at this point in time. And what little money he did earn from his consultations, his commissions, his architectural projects, he plowed back into his work. He funded the journal to style out of his own resources. Mondrian had parted company after the elementalism issue surfaced. So when Theo Van Duesberg died of heart trouble prematurely, the movement just stopped. It was no longer a movement. It was people doing things. But the style lives to this day. 
You cannot go into any city in any developed country in the world without seeing the evidence of the style, this sense of elementary color and form and functionalism at work. Let's take a multinational corporation like Exxon. All over the world, they've put up their Exxon sign. It's made up of primary colors in black and white, simple geometric shaped letters with a rectangle under it. We could go through corporation after corporation and make this relationship. Architecture. There is not a building on this campus or any university campus in Europe or North America built after World War II that does not show the pronounced influence of the style. As you leave this building, which is a real clunker, and if there was an er ever a 1958 academic lecture building gone wrong, this is it. But nevertheless, as you leave the building, notice the light fixtures. Notice the simple railings. Notice that aluminum and glass door as you leave the building. All of those things, granted eighth generation bastard design perhaps, but nevertheless, they are extensions of the style. By way of the Bauhaus, but that's another lecture and we'll talk about that next week. Thank you.
organized horizontal and vertical structuring and the balancing of elements to achieve a harmony. It's very important that this five is big down here in opposition to this G, for example. Late work by Bart, Bart Vanderlick, we see that the illustrations become a kind of geometric stencil treatment. We also find that the typeface he designed is an open stencil quality typeface that has the properties of the style. Note the use of little squares of color to indicate the start of a paragraph, the bars of color to indicate a new section, and then the bars of color to indicate the end of certain important sections in the book. It's probably the ultimate de style book in terms of applying these principles of harmony and structure and primary color to the problem of book design. It's a poster by Hussar. This was 1929. The diagonal becomes interesting. It's a break. Mondrian and Theo van Duisburg parted company when Theo van Duisburg suddenly decided he was going to develop the theory of elementalism and that the diagonal was more dynamic than horizontals and verticals. Mondrian was beside himself and their collaboration ended around the mid-twenties when van Duisburg made this theoretical break without talking to Mondrian about it or consulting him, just, I have an idea and he wrote an article about this theory of elementalism, published it into style, and Mondrian was upset. Hussar here was exploring the dynamic of the diagonal. Application to architecture. All over the world, there are floors of linoleum and vinyl that trace their, her their heritage to this floor. This design in the late teens for a floor by Theo van Duisburg. This was a tile floor. It was made up of a dynamic geometric configuration of white, yellow, and black. This is his working plan. Here we're looking down the stairwell at the floor on the first floor. Note the treatment of black around the floor and around the doors. And note the way this stairwell has a geometric step quality. This building is probably the first one to begin to apply some of the ideas of the style around 1918, 1919 to the problem of architecture. But the first true de style building is the Schroeder House, built in Holland in 1924 designed by Garrett Rittveld. Here's the model. We can see that it's made up of planes in space, very dynamic, open composition. Here's the house. Looking at the street that it was on with the house next to it, it's little wonder that the Schroeder children suffered taunts at school, that rocks were thrown, at the house by neighbors who were offended that this wild modern avant-garde building went up at the end of the block. It's a detail of the second floor balcony show, showing a plane that's just literally floating a suspended in space there on the balcony. This photograph was made right after the house was built wonderful property of light and air. Here's the dining room, and note how this window opens up and just opens up the whole corner of the house. This house is now a museum. The lady who commissioned this, Ms. Schroeder, was certainly a very courageous and perceptive woman. Inside the dining room, note the industrial radiators, note the openness of the structure, the linear quality of the structure, and the way the corner is open, and that window that's open wrapped around the corner, and then the support beam is moved off the corner a little bit. This would give this dynamic asymmetrical property. 
Note the use of yellow on the woodwork and just above the radiator. The floor plan was very open. These partitions would move in space so you could close off an area for privacy or open up the space and let it flow. This photograph was made right after the house was built, and we can see that all the furniture is built according to the style principles. See, Café de Uni, which was by J.J.P. Ald, one of the initial members of the movement. This shows the color treatment, the integration of letter forms and information with architecture and structure. Here's a black and white photograph made at the time. I'm told that this cafe, this important building in architecture, was destroyed during World War II. Note how the signage functions. The low sign on the right functioned for pedestrians close by. The high sign functioned for people across the street in the high-rise buildings a ways away, way down the street. And then this vertical sign worked for people in cars or on foot coming down the street and be two or three blocks away. Very careful and rational and logical in planning this signage. And that's an important aspect of all the style design was this rational, logical qualities. This is a theoretical design as opposed to an actual room. But Mondrian and some of the others collaborated on working out this room that becomes sort of a a theoretical, a prototype, the style room. Rittfeld was very active in furniture design. Here's a beautiful hutch or cabinet to go in a dining room. Note how the furniture is made of these horizontal and vertical members that overlap, and then how the drawers are so open they aren't com confined like drawers in most things, but they're very open and you can just reach in here and pull it out. The doors are planes that float in front of the structure, which open up. A lighting fixture by Rittveld, beautiful. These three independent lights hang by glass tubes that have wires inside, and they're placed in this dynamic three-way relationship. As you move around this lighting fixture, it changes and looks different from all different angles. Rittveld was very conscious of the notion that furniture and architecture has this three-dimensional compositional property that all sculpture has, and that it has to work in its visual design properties no matter what angle you look at it. And as I was looking at the 10 or so slides that I made of this, trying to pick which one was best to bring to class today. They were all equally good, even though some were from a distance, some were close up and from different angles. It seemed to work as you move around it as a composition that's been very carefully considered. Rittveld's wheelbarrow. It makes me happy every time I see this wheelbarrow. Those beautiful, bright colors and that happiness that I feel when I see this wheelbarrow is an important spiritual aspect of what this style was about. Now, the joyous simplicity and purity was important to them. Now, I love this table. It's a circular plane for a base, two vertical planes and a horizontal plane plus a linear strip for support for that top. Is that beautiful? It's wonderful. It's a table. It would be a little table to hold a lamp and go by your chair. It's actually a rather, it looks bigger in the slide than it actually is. There were a number of commissions which were quite successful. This is a commission that Van Duesburg led a collaborative group this was actually built. It's now destroyed. There's a combination restaurant, dance hall, theater in France. 
the booze went here. This is a model, a reconstruction. The booze went here. You could dance in the middle. You see the movie screen at the end of the wall. And these environmental planes of color turned this into this wonderful overall environment. signage for that cafe, which you maybe have difficulty seeing, but here Theo Van Duesburg has worked out colors and numerical symbols to work out signage. We see words such as cabaret and bathrooms, billiards, and an identification system to harmonize with the architectural and interior design treatment. This is one of Theo van Duesburg's paintings. It was done after he developed this theory of elementalism, which ended his relationship to Mondrian. It's a beautiful and dynamic painting in which the horizontals and verticals of the style are just rotated within the frame to compose with diagonal movements instead of horizontal and vertical movements probably one of the most exciting red squares in the history of art. This is the cover for the final issue of De Stael magazine. Van Duesburg died early. He was, I believe, in his early 50s when he died in 1931. His wife and some of the other members of the group put together the final issue, which dealt with his life and his work. It reproduced his experimental architecture, his paintings, his typography. It reprinted some of his essays and articles on the theory of art, the theory of design. As a movement, the style collapsed with the death of Theo van Duesburg. When I said he was the founder and guiding spirit, I could have said that for all practical purposes, he was the style. He was the energy that held the movement together, that promoted the movement. He never had very much money. These avant-garde artists were not rich and successful in terms of the material world at this point in time. And what little money he did earn from his consultations, his commissions, his architectural projects, he plowed back into his work. He funded the journal to style out of his own resources. Mondrian had parted company after the elementalism issue surfaced. So when Theo van Duesburg died of heart trouble <coughs> prematurely, the movement just stopped. It was no longer a movement. It was people doing things. But the style lives to this day. You cannot go into any city in any developed country in the world without seeing the evidence of the style, this sense of elementary color and form and functionalism at work. Let's take a multinational corporation like Exxon. All over the world, they've put up their Exxon sign. It's made up of primary colors in black and white, simple geometric shaped letters with a rectangle under it. We could go through corporation after corporation and make this relationship. Architecture. There is not a building on this campus or any university campus in Europe or North America built after World War II that does not show the pronounced influence of the style. As you leave this building, which is a real clunker, and if there was an er ever a 1958 academic lecture building gone wrong, this is it. But nevertheless, as you leave the building, notice the light fixtures. Notice the simple railings. Notice that aluminum and glass door as you leave the building. All of those things, granted eighth generation bastard design perhaps, but nevertheless, they are extensions of the style. By way of the Bauhaus, but that's another lecture and we'll talk about that next week. Thank you.